Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm hosting this on the lands of the Budurong people. I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which you all join us today, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and acknowledge their continuing connections to land, waters and community. My name's Maddie Moore. I'm the Acting Manager of Advocacy at the National Trust in Victoria, and I coordinate our Climate Action Plan Working Group. So thanks for joining us for this very special event to officially launch the 2023 Australian Heritage Festival in Victoria. Today, we'll be hearing from Justin Buckley on the sustainable projects underway at the National Trust-owned Rippon Lee Estate. I'll now be handing over to Philip Goad, Chair of the Heritage Council of Victoria, to officially launch the Australian Heritage Festival. Hello, I'm Professor Philip Go, Chair of the Heritage Council of Victoria. So welcome to the 2023 Australian Heritage Festival, the country's largest community-based heritage celebration. The festival, festival begins on Tuesday the 18th of April, the International Day for Monuments and Science, and it will conclude on Thursday the 18th of May, the International Day for Museums. Now, before I officially launch this year's festival, in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I wish to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today on the lands of the people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. The 2023 Heritage Festival is delivered by the National Trust and is proudly sponsored by the Heritage Council of Victoria. Over the next few weeks, over half a million people will experience heritage, sites and events around the country. In Victoria, the festival is comprised of events from across the state organised by National Trust properties and branches, community groups, local councils, traditional owner groups, individuals and other organisations. Now, the Heritage Council is an independent statutory body which recognises, protects and celebrates Victoria's cultural heritage. The Council advises the government and others on how to conserve and protect historic historically important objects and places for the enjoyment of future and current generations. The Heritage Festival is all about sharing with others our passion for and fascination with heritage. This year, the 2023 theme of the festival, Shared Stories, invites communities to discover the hidden tales about Victoria's cultural heritage. And I'd encourage you all to engage with events that tell those stories. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to experience our state's heritage firsthand, and I'd like to especially extend my thanks to the many, many volunteers who make this festival possible. Please enjoy this month-long celebration of heritage. Well, thanks for that, Philip. I'll now hand over to Justin Buckley for the presentation on Rip and Lee. Justin Buckley is our Executive Manager of South City Properties and Manager of National Trust Gardens. Take it away, Justin. Thank you, Maddie. And hello, everybody. Great to be here. I will just share my screen if you give me one sec. Uh, hi, yes, I'm Justin Buckley. I'm Executive Manager of National Trust Gardens in Victoria. And today I'll be taking you through a recent project we undertook at Rip and Lee and how it revealed more about the site and its history and surrounds than we had expected. Uh, water was central to this project. And as you'll see, water is central to uh, just about everything and the stories of Rip and Lee. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Bunurong people 
and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. For those of you unfamiliar with Ripponlea Estate, I'll start by giving an overview of the site and its major features. Uh, today, Ripponlea covers 14 acres located in Bayside, Melbourne. It's six kilometres from the Melbourne CBD and less than two kilometres from Port Phillip Bay. Uh, it's one of 120 places on Australia's National Heritage List and it's the only Victorian National Trust property on that list. Uh, Rip and Lee was the home of Sir Frederick Sargood and his family, a very wealthy merchant family in the soft furnishings trade. Uh, Sargood later became a politician. He held several ministries in the Victorian colony and he was also elected to Australia's first federal parliament as a senator in 1901. Um, as you can see, Ripponlea has a very large and impressive mansion, complete with tower, ballroom and 19th century kitchens. Uh, what's a little different about Ripponlea to other similar places is just how intact the garden and the grounds are. Almost the entire 19th century ornamental pleasure garden survives, uh, including most of the outbuildings and structures from this time, which is very unusual for these large suburban mansions. Um, as a garden team, we're particularly proud to say that Ripon Lee is primarily significant for its garden. Uh, for me, the crowning glory of Ripon Lee would have to be the fernery. It's one of the world's great surviving ferneries, uh, really on an impressive scale. It's 40 metres long with a fern gully and grotto excavated well below the ground throughout it. Uh, we have one of the original surviving 19th century conservatories, uh, showing just how much the garden was also incorporated into the house. Uh, you would originally, you could leave the dining room, step directly into a conservatory, which would take you through to the glass ballroom, which would take you direct to the fernery itself. They really were um, proud of their garden and brought it inside with them. Uh, there was a significant working side to the property as well. Uh, what's left of that today includes a heritage orchard with 120 different varieties of apple and pear. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be a grand Victorian garden without a grotto and rockwork, and such as this cave that takes you behind the waterfall with views out across the lake. Uh, there was a lookout tower built on top of the grotto that has views across Port Phillip Bay. Uh, the 1930s swimming pool was really the only major change that's happened uh, to the garden that was in addition uh, by the last owner, Louisa Jones, when she inherited the property in the 1930s. Uh, it's built on the site of the original ballroom and is the focus of our functions and events today. And as I mentioned earlier, there's most of the uh, surviving rustic outbuildings are, are still here in the garden. So there's a tennis pavilion, a summer house, a boathouse, an archery hut, uh, the stables and coach house that have uh, all somehow survived 100 years of private ownership. And the most important feature for the purposes of my talk today is, of course, the lake, uh, which covers around an acre or 4,000 square metres of the garden. So when we say estate, uh, Ripon Lee was originally 45 acres, uh, included a large working site to the property, as I mentioned. There were lots of veggie gardens, cow paddocks, dams, uh, a firing range where the local militia trained, uh, a village to house the staff, and a lot of mouths to feed on site every day. And I've got another view here of the working garden. Uh, there's a big uh, orchard laid out in the shape of a wagon wheel at the front left of that photo, uh, including areas netted and under glass. Uh, and most of this part of the property was what was subdivided and lost in the early 20th century. So gardening was Sir Frederick Sargood's main passion. Uh, there was no time wasted and no expense spared in developing his grand garden in the English landscape tradition. The photo on the left is the earliest photo we have of uh, the mansion completed, and on the right, uh, you can see 10 years later, uh, there was a highly manicured 15 acres of garden attached to the property. And this is the approach from the main entrance on Hotham Street in 1880 and today. 
And as you can imagine, you know, a lot of effort was required to do this to the landscape and a lot of water was required as well if it was going to succeed. And this is a photo of the typical local vegetation. So this is taken in Glenire Road in 1880, just around the corner from Ripon Lee. And so this is the kind of natural landscape that they were looking to transform. And just note the standing water at the front of that tree there. And back to Ripon Lee in 1880. Uh, so it wasn't a complete transformation of the surrounding landscapes. It did incorporate some of those elements into the design. If you See the tall tree in the centre of this photo is a river red gum, a remnant gum tree existing on the site. And that was in what was a wet, poorly drained area, which uh, they turned they turned that poorly drained area into a picturesque lake. And it's worth mentioning that the trunk of that uh, river red gum still survives to this day. The tree has died at some point in the 20th century, but the trunk has been retained, which is a priceless link we still have to the original landscape property. And so the lake was enlarged further uh, by 1903 when Sir Frederick died. Um, importantly, the lake is more than an ornamental feature. Its, its primary purpose is a storage reservoir for the garden's irrigation supply. Uh, so for, at a time, Sargwood was a commissioner for water in the colony and was able to draw, we presume, on a lot of uh, government expertise and apply this to his own needs in his garden. So the lake, uh, which is just here, if you can see my pointer. So the lake is really the centre of a sophisticated water harvesting system uh, designed by Sargu. It collects spring water and storm water from off-site and from also harvests rainwater from the buildings on the property. And water is stored in the lake and then it's pumped around the garden to irrigate the garden. Uh, so the area that is now Caulfield Park up here on the right, about two kilometres away from Ripon Lee, this was a swamp. It was known as Paddy Swamp in colonial times. And uh, water was really seen as a problem in this part of town that needed to be dealt with. So this, the stormwater system that was laid out and was designed to deal with this problem by removing the water so the land could be suitably developed. Uh, the water didn't go away, of course. Uh, the natural waterways of the southeast were effectively buried and paved over, paved over uh, with streams now running underground. And you can see, if you follow these lines, this is the diversion of that natural water. And the Ripon Lee Lake uh, is an artificial diversion and loop within that modified natural system. Now, the effort and expense of doing this really can't be overstated, especially in a, on a private property. Uh, this is a map of Sargood's uh, irrigation and drainage system from the, from the 1880s. The, the lake itself is uh, here to the left. And if you can hopefully make out on your screens all these diagonal lines that are running right the way across the map. Uh, these are subsurface drains designed to carry groundwater and stormwater across 45 acres of property. And many of these pipes are several metres underground. It was a huge undertaking. And even today, many of these pipes, uh, you can make out the lines. And this is, this is the reduced size of Ripon as it is today. Um, but they, they, the drainage is still crucial to the conservation of the site. If these pipes don't get maintained and they block up, uh, water backs up and floods the mansion. And of course, the main problem with having 150 year old pipes in a 150 year old garden is tree roots. So they're our biggest problem. And uh, maintaining the drains here has always been a unique part of being a garden at Ripon Lee, as demonstrated here by Daniel from the garden team, who's been hard at work getting those pipes flowing again. Uh, now, there's literally dozens of pits and hundreds of metres of pipe to be maintained across the property. And this had become increasingly difficult. It's expensive. It's dangerous. Uh, it's a lot to ask of people. You, you know, it's not very sophisticated. You're effectively sticking a big corkscrew down the pipes and pulling out the tree roots by hand. 
And much of it is confined space entry work and some of it, such as in a pit like this, you're actually working three metres underground to do that. So in order to deal with this, uh, we applied for an Australian Heritage Grant through the federal government. Uh, and that was the, the start of this project I'm describing today. So it was a pretty simple proposition to begin with. Uh, we wanted to reline the original drainage pipes uh, we didn't want to be digging up the garden, putting in new uh, modern systems that would be very destructive. Uh, so relining was the answer. And here's a before and after shot of, of that work that's happened here at the site. Um, no diggings required. They can do it all from above ground. Pretty straightforward and problem solved. Uh, but an equally important outcome for this project was to try and find a way to interpret the system, which is basically just a way of saying, um, finding a way to tell people about the system. We knew we had an amazing engineering feat, a bit of a marvel really, uh, here on site, quite unique, certainly for a private property, um, but it's almost entirely hidden from view. So aside from a few maps, such as this one, uh, that we had and plans of the, the drainage, we had nothing we could actually show people. So really the, the most challenging part of the project became answering the question, how do you show people something that they can't see? And we were fortunate to come across a team from Monash University who've been tackling this very problem and they agreed to take on the project with us. Um, they'd been looking not only at ways to reveal heritage that is hidden, but also to put, they'd also put a lot of uh, research into mapping the changes that have occurred to the landscape and waterways of southeast Melbourne. Uh, now it's hard to do justice to that work that they've done in a few minutes here and I'll refer later to where you can find more detailed information um, but in short their work is it's essentially building an underground atlas of the city and this then becomes a strategy to present new narratives and reveal more than you know the traditional wealthy white man does something incredible uh, heritage narrative of years past. Um, and it also helps to reveal the multiple and interconnected layers that there are at play in these heritage stories. So, get my pointer back. So the first layer to be revealed, I guess, is the, is the wider landscape that Ripley sits within. So this is a map of colonial Melbourne CBD. It's up here to the top. Ripley sits just off the map around here. Uh, now it can be counterintuitive if you're familiar with gardening in the dry sandy soils of southeast Melbourne, um, but this was a wet landscape. So there are wetlands and chains of ponds covered a large area from Port Melbourne uh, all the way around to Elwood that's covered by this map. And uh, Albert Park Lake, which is here, is really one of the few surviving examples of this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, water was seen as a problem that needed to be solved. And if we go back a little further in time, uh, there's been far greater changes to this part of the world uh, in the not too distant past. So current research suggests that between 1,000 to 3,000 years ago, Port Phillip Bay was actually a grassy plain, Port Phillip here, uh, that became inundated by the sea. And this research that actually aligns with stories that the Bunurong people have passed down since that time. And it's been described as a, a, a time of chaos. And um, so here's what's now the shoreline of the bay. Uh, today, this whole area was a grassy plain and the Yarra flowed down through it into a lake, which would sit roughly uh, east of where Queenscliff is now. So not that long ago, rather than being a couple of kilometres from the ocean, uh, as it is today, you would have been able to walk in a straight line from Ripon Lee to Port Arlington, basically, and crossing the Yarra, Yarra River on the way. Now, zooming in a little closer uh, to the local Ripon Lee landscape, and this slide shows why Sargood went to such expense in installing um, all that drainage across a 45 acre property. This is uh, Ripon Lee. The original outline of it is the larger, of 
those pink uh, squares and as it is today, the, the hatched section. And this map shows his, all the historical flooding events uh, from Caulfield right across to Elwood in the immediate area. And again, showing just how seasonally wet this area was. Um, Caulfield Park again is up here to the east, what was Paddy Swamp. And these blue lines show you where the stormwater system was built to take that excess water and to try and deal with that flooding and enable the land to be uh, developed. And to the south of where we are here too, it's worth mentioning, this is the Elster Creek area um, that flows into Elwood Canal today. So now nearly all of this water, it's still there, but it now flows underground. And of course, we haven't managed to completely conquer nature by doing this. Um, when there's enough rain and the tide is high enough, uh, the suburb of Bellwood between here and the, the bay uh, floods periodically. Uh, recently is 2016. And the history of water is, of course, inextricably linked to the history of First Nations people and their connection to country. And uh, with this project, it was very important to us that the, the voice of traditional owners, owners was central to the project. Uh, we interviewed Nawit Carolyn Briggs, an elder from the Bunurung Foundation, and hers is the primary voice that you'll hear in the audio visual interpretation of the project as she welcomes you to country, and invites you to observe and listen to the many layers of stories that are present and being revealed. And listening was identified by the project team early on as a key medium for revealing these stories, um, as sound really helps to reveal more than you can see, uh, especially those sounds that we're unable to hear or we unconsciously block out. Um, the team recorded a wide range of sounds in some unlikely places. Uh, here we have a recording of the sound of that ancient spring water flowing from Caulfield Park towards Ripon Lee, flowing now under Glen Ivor Road. And I'll just play uh, the sounds of that. And if you listen, you should be able to hear also a occasional thump, which is the sound of uh, cars driving over manholes that reverberates through those trains as well. And they also used hydrophones, which are uh, microphones that can be used underwater. So, um, yeah, they capture sounds beneath water. And uh, we've got some uh, footage and sound here of recording taken within the lake. So if you're standing by the lake, uh, as far as we're aware, it's all still and silent. Um, but actually, when you drop a hydrophone in the lake, it's all kind of life. Uh, buzzing and whirring beneath the surface of the capture. So those layers of sound have been recorded and um, incorporated into an app that also features uh, an augmented reality rendering of the location of the pipe spirit you need beneath your feet. Um, so the idea is that you're through the app, you're led to some of the key locations on site and encouraged to stop and listen as you, you uh, scan your phone up and down through the various layers of, of sound that have been captured and uh, reveal the hidden drainage system uh, below your feet also which we, we didn't want to have signs covering the whole property trying to explain this. Um, and so the app is how we chose to reveal it. Uh, now, even though the lake is an entirely contrived and constructed feature, uh, it's, it's highly modified, it serves an important purpose beyond its role as an irrigation storage tank. Uh, the lake 
enables a huge array of wildlife to thrive in a highly urbanised area. Um, this includes the short fin eel, uh, which has a rather miraculous life cycle that sees it spawn in tropical waters in the Coral Sea. Uh, they then swim thousands of kilometres south, and then some of them manage to find their way into the Ripponlea Lake. Um, now, to do this, they have to swim into the bay, swim up the stormwater drainage system, and navigate their way through the same drains that we've been uh, we've been describing. And then somehow we, we assume that they've actually got to make it some of the last part of that trek overland to actually actually find the lake. Uh, they live their entire life in, in the lake. And then uh, at the end of their life, they make their way back into the sea, swim back to the coral sea to spawn and to die. That's uh, really an amazing story. And of course, uh, the eel is a very important food source for people across much of what uh, is, is now Victoria. So basically the lake harnesses and stores the water that supports the garden, which in turn supports a really rich and diverse uh, environment, as I said, in a highly urbanised area. Um, this diversity is something we're coming to understand more and more. Um, bird life in particular, uh, is, is able to thrive at Ripponlea in a way that uh, is not seen in similar sized parks nearby. Um, this is due to the, the, the complex structure of the garden. It's got many layers of trees and shrubbery that, that provide cover and niches for, for the particularly smaller birds that get bullied out of parks uh, and gardens by a more aggressive species. And yeah, so as a result of that the irrigation and drainage system here, Ripponlea uh, is recognised as a top five biodiversity hotspot within the city of Glenira. And the city of Glenira is a local government area with the least amount of public open space in the whole of Victoria. Um, so it really uh, plays a very important role for biodiversity in, uh, in this highly urbanised area. Um, the, I mean, the kind of parks and gardens we've been designing for the last 60 or 70 years, uh, especially parks, basically just grass and eucalypts, um, they're, they're, they're cheaper and they're easier to maintain than a garden like this, uh, but, but comparatively they have poor biodiversity outcomes. Um, so the, the scale and structure of heritage gardens, uh, especially uh, on a scale such as Rip and Lee, means that they they're going to play an ever increasing role in providing refuge and amenity uh, for all life forms in, in urbanized areas um, and it's the water security provided by that 150 year old system that is central to that um, i should add that that the system's been there for 150 years but we've certainly uh, modernized it so um, it's, it's got modern automated irrigation system attached to it, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, so it's highly efficient. Um, there was a lot of flood, ir flood irrigation uh, that happened in the past, but now um, even though uh, it's, it's a harvested water system, we, we certainly uh, want it to be as efficient as possible. So it's, it's a very modern system uh, that's been adapted from a 150 year old design. And all of this is really a long way of saying that even the most um, prosaic of projects like restoring old drains can tell a much bigger story around sustainability and community. And this project's just been one example of the vital role our heritage gardens uh, will play in our cities of the future. And the more we can reveal about why they matter, uh, the more support we can build for their ongoing care. And so for us, uh, the main takeaways from this project, they, I guess, they really speak to building and maintaining relevance. Um, that's the big challenge to managers of heritage places, especially heritage um, gardens in a changing climate. Um, and I guess just to, yeah, to summarize, uh, I guess what the key, the key things we've learned from this project or wanna share from this project is that, uh, you know, really, heritage is about telling stories, as as per the theme of the Heritage Festival this year. 
Um, and, but those stories are, are always multi-layered and you really want to be having, hearing all those stories told. Um, we need to put heritage places in their wider context. Uh, we need to go beyond the gates and beyond the, the nice iron fence, for example, here at Ripon Lee, which I think has been uh, the view of the past. We want, we want to put heritage places at the heart of their community. Um, we don't want to be, oh, the, the nice old building down the road, I went to a wedding there once, which is something we used to hear a lot in the past, uh, in an area, as I said, in uh, this part of Melbourne, uh, with very little public open space, we've got a real role to play uh, for, the, for the local community. And you know, heritage places, they need not be relics. Um, they embody multiple values that are central to community wellbeing and amenity. Now, if you'd like to delve deeper into the project, we have some visual essays uh, online that go into much greater detail about some of these things. Uh, the Hidden Ripponley app and essays are being launched uh, during Des Melbourne Design Week on May 28th, but you can take a sneak peek. Uh, now, if you search Hidden Ripponley, you will be able to find it. Um, thank you for your time, and I'll pass you back to Maddie, and we'll see if there are any questions uh, we can take from the chat. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for that, Justin. That was a fantastic presentation on uh, the interpretation that we're working on at Rip and Lee and a really great story, I think, of historic sustainability and how we can make that relevant now and, and utilise the tools that we have received from some really incredible engineering of the past. Um, so I'd encourage everyone, please do um, put any questions you might have in the chat so that we can ask Justin. Um, just to kick us off, I've, I've got a couple myself. So regarding the extensive nature of these pipe systems at Rip and Lee, when it came to um, restoration works and maintenance, did there need to be much research done into that or was there already a very well-established record keeping for, for these, um, these pipe systems? Yeah, it, it was pretty good really compared to uh, some holes we've got in our other records for a property like this that we wish we had. Um, I should also add too that this is really the culmination of uh, 25 years work. So, modern, so really modernising um, and bringing the, the Sargood irrigation system back to life uh, was, was identified in the 1990s as a, as a priority here. And of course, the millennium drought um, really increased that as a priority. Um, I should also mention, of course, that it, it fell out of favour for a period in the early 20th century um, as, as potable water was, was uh, laid out around Melbourne. This, this system was, was uh, superseded, I guess, by uh, galvanised pipes connected to the Melbourne water supply that were um, you know, are a problem for us now as they rust and, and leak and break. So. Um, we, it's really from the 1980s that the National Trust resurrected this system and it's taken us 25 years um, really to get the whole point where we've, in, we've been able to increase the coverage of the irrigation system. Uh, we're 95% self-sufficient for water now and, um, and we've managed to reline the drains, which wasn't even a technology that was around 25 years ago. Fantastic. And um, we've just had a question about the eels. So how long do they stay in the lakes as part of their lifespan? And are there many eels in the lake? What do they add to the biodiversity from Max? Uh, there are many eels in the lake. Um, some of the other uh, lake dwellers, such as the turtles, are much more shy. But um, there's a couple of spots in the garden where you're pretty much guaranteed of finding a an eel, or if you uh, want to get down into the muck and the uh, mud in the bottom of the lake, often you'll find an eel wanting to know uh, what you're up to there. Um, I don't pretend to know, and I think there's still a lot we don't know about um, the, the role they play in this environment, but it's certainly um, understood that they, once they've made, once they've swum here uh, after spawning, that they, they spend their entire life in the waterways of Southern Australia and only make the trip back north to the tropics um, at the end of their life. And 
um, by all accounts, they're on they're on their last legs and death's door by the time they they do get back there. It really is an incredible lifespan that they that they live. Um, we have another questions come through. Do we know how much water is running through the drain system? Oh well, I mean we we use probably ten megalitres a year of it, so ten million litres, and that's just a fraction of the the water that that flows through this system. Um, I mean, it's it's a massive catchment area. Uh, if you picture that map I showed with all the, the historic flood areas, um, that's many square kilometres and um, many millions of litres of water falling on that, finding its way into the groundwater, which is then finding its way through the springs. And um, I, I was at a talk a few years ago where um, Someone from Melbourne Water was describing that they that how much water is flowing through the Elwood Canal in a flood event, and it was a mind-boggling figure. The, the amount of water that comes through Ripon Lane here was, was only a fraction of that. Right. Um, I'd also like to ask a, a question, a bit leading, uh, especially for our um, attendees today. How can people visit Ripon Lee and, and engage with um, the app that's now available and the garden as well? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, we're open 363 days a year, so uh, you can come anytime uh, except Good Friday and Christmas Day. Uh, if you're a National Trust member, of course, you have free entry uh, as often as you like, um, but also we've got a great relationship with um, the two local councils uh, around us here, being Glen Ira and Port Phillip and uh, they support their residents to get free garden access, um, again, as uh, unlimited. So if you do reside within um, Glen Eyre and Port Phillip, um, I'd encourage you to be a National Trust member, but if you um, would prefer just to visit uh, Ripon Lee, you can come and sign up to our resident access program at the Gatehouse entry. Sorry, just going to take a drink. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, okay, well, there don't seem to be any more questions coming in. So um, I'd just like to thank everybody for, for joining us today. Uh, really great to kick off the Australian Heritage Festival um, in this way. And uh, a reminder to everyone too, this is part one of four webinars that we'll be hosting over the course of the Australian Heritage Festival. So please join us again next Friday, uh, same time, same place, two o'clock on Zoom. We'll be learning all about trees and landscape protection with Yelena from our Environmental Heritage um, Advocate and um, Joanna Wells, who's the Trees Advocate for the National Trust in South Australia. So um, thanks everybody so much for joining us again. We hope um, you enjoyed the presentation and have a lovely afternoon.